Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, March 18th, was National Agriculture Day, and a Mississippi youth won its National Video Essay Contest. The Farm Week crew braves the ice and snow to be part of the fan zone at RFD TV's The American Rodeo. In Southern Gardening, the Saucer Magnolia, it's a smaller magnolia with a beauty all its own. In the food factor, avoid pantry pests by giving it a good spring cleaning this spring. In the markets, U.S. catfish processing and sales pick up as pond bank prices level out. And the fundamentals of the cotton trade share some similarities with what's happening in the soybean market. In the feature segment of the 2015 Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions, it's the pinnacle of the junior livestock show circuit in Mississippi. The sale set another record this year for the total amount of winning bids. Playing sports, you do have to have dedication to stay in practice, but you don't have that of caring for a life. I mean, you have to, with sports, if it rains, if it rains one day, you're all right with animals. It's, Cold, sleet, snow, it doesn't matter. You have to feed your animal, you have to work your animal. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. National Agriculture Day was celebrated Wednesday and a Mississippi youth was celebrated as well. Leighton, each year the National Agriculture Council of America sponsors National Ag Day. As a part of that, the council sponsors a national essay contest with print and video categories. Well, Harsin Sanjawala of Madison, Mississippi was named the winner of the video essay division. He was honored this week at the National Ag Day festivities. He received a thousand dollar prize for his efforts. Sandra Walla included in his video several man on the street interviews which showed how little the average person knows about agriculture and the challenges facing it. He also interviewed Cindy Hyde Smith, Mississippi's Commissioner of Agriculture, Agriculture and Commerce. Farm Week extends its congratulations to him on his win. And Leighton, you know, Mississippi agriculture, over $7 billion in production value last year, you know, over 20% of the employment in the state due to agriculture. So naturally, we celebrate the efforts that you do out there because it's private business making jobs. But it is amazing. Here we are, a fairly rural state still, but so many people don't realize the impact agriculture has. And with uh, agriculture, a lot of absentee landowners, so you have a lot of forestry going on in our state. So it's the kind of deal that if we didn't have that agricultural power, uh, it would be affecting more people. Certainly would. Well, moving on, as winter begins to fade away and the temperatures start to rise, many people will start to process the spring cleaning. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes of the Mississippi State University Extension Service reminds us to not forget about the pantry and don't be alarmed if you run across some pantry pests. What? What is going on? I love buying in bulk. It saves me money, but did you know that your pantry can harbor food pests that eats holes in your budget? Pantry pests like mealworms, weevils, beetles, and moths love open packaging and those foods you don't use often, but keep on hand. Finding these bugs doesn't mean your house is dirty. Most of these insects come into our homes in food that's already infested. Grain products such as flour, cornmeal, and grits Cereal and even cake mixes are prime real estate for insects looking for a tasty home. So how do you keep those pantry pests out of your food? Store food in an airtight container with a tight fitting lid. Keep flour and other dry goods in the freezer. And immediately clean up spills and crumbs to avoid unwanted attention from these pesky bugs. 
This year when you're doing your spring cleaning, throw out those expired foods and be on the lookout for pantry pets. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Natasha says another tip to keep in mind is to use bay leaves in your flower to create a natural deterrent for insects. Most of us are familiar with the southern magnolia, the Mississippi State tree. Well, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman tells us about another variety of magnolia that stands out in the spring landscape. Have you ever been driving down the street in the spring and notice a small tree that's blazing with purplish pink flowers? You're seeing Saucer Magnolia, one of the stars of the spring landscape. Saucer Magnolia, known botanically as Magnolia solangiana, is by far the most popular of the flowering magnolias. They bloom before the leaves emerge, so the flowers are the main attraction. The flower buds develop on the ends of the branches and are pubescent and silky to the touch. The buds swell and begin to open, revealing the first glimpse of the coming colorful show. When the flower petals unfurl and finally open, they are huge. Some selections can have flowers up to 10 inches across. The outside of the saucer magnolia flowers are mostly pinkish purple, while the inside is creamy white. Other selections can have flowers with bold and bright purples. There are many selections and cultivars to choose from, and the decision may be hard to make. Saucer magnolia is considered a small tree, maybe eventually reaching 20 feet by 20 feet. They are a good choice as a low maintenance, easy to care for plant. Be sure to plant in the full sun in well-drained soil. Saucer magnolia is a cross from Europe between different deciduous magnolias dating back to the 1820s. The story goes that the saucer magnolia was developed to bring beauty back to the European landscape after the Napoleonic Wars. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Leighton, the Missouri Botanical Garden says that the saucer magnolia was developed originally in France. Well, in the feature segment today, more records fell at this year's 2015 Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. We'll have the highlights. And we've been on the road. We have. Speaking of highlights, the Farm Week crew took a road trip out west to Arlington, Texas three weeks ago. We arrived right in the middle of, you guessed it, sleet, freezing rain, and snow. Now, we weren't there to get another taste of winter, which we've had enough of in Mississippi. We were, were there to meet the viewers passing through the RFD TV fan zone across the street from AT&T Stadium where the world's richest one day rodeo is taking place. It was the weekend of the second annual RFD TV The American Event and it was a good thing the AT&T venue is an enclosed stadium and that there were giant tents for programmers and vendors in the fan zone. It was so cold and wet that Sunday morning scheduled Cowboy Church abandoned the RFD TV stage in the fan zone. It moved into this tent where it was standing room only. Now there was no shortage of people during the weekend events and the rodeo itself, despite the weather, more than 40,000 folks attended the RFD TV, the American Rodeo at AT&T Stadium on Sunday afternoon, March 1st. And as you know, that is the home of the Dallas Cowboys. Yes, it was. And we'd like to appreciate all the folks that came by and said hi to us. You know, it's, it's, we saw folks from Mississippi, but we also saw folks from across the nation that said yeah. they like to watch. So we appreciate that as well. Time now for the markets with Layton. And you say there's no avian flu as far as Mississippi is concerned? That is correct. And Sanderson Farms says it's not been identified in any of the states it operates in. Also ahead today, an uptick in U.S. catfish processing and sales the strong dollar is hurting U.S. commodity exports, while the cotton trade right now is said to be similar to the soybean market. Brownfield Ag News reports this week the danger of avian flu in poultry is being overplayed. Meanwhile, the closest infected flock to Mississippi is on the Arkansas-Missouri border. Mississippi's largest chicken operator, Sanderson Farms, says the avian flu has not been identified in any of its operations. Sanderson has a full biosecurity program in place and tests all flocks before they are processed. 
Well, the main numbers are up in the latest aquaculture report. It was out on Friday, the 13th of March. Let's take a look. In February, U.S. producers received a pond bank price of $1.14 per pound for premium size live fish. That's basically flat with what was paid both a year ago and last month. Farm sales totaled over 26 million pounds round weight. That is up 3% from February 2014. Processor sales total just over 13 and one half million pounds, an increase of 8% from a year ago. A campaign to increase the beef checkoff is ready for launch. However, at least three different groups are opposing the proposed increase from $1 to $2 per head. Meanwhile, the latest government numbers indicate a little bit of herd expansion showing up now in the cattle sector. Extension Ag economist Brian Williams of Mississippi State discussed the on-feed report with me recently. Brian, did the cattle on-feed report come out close to the pre-report expectations? It was pretty close. Uh, looking at the numbers themselves, uh, total on-feed was up just, just slightly, and the uh, expectation was for it to be un unchanged. Uh, then marketings were down about 9%, and that was real close to expectations and uh, placements were down 11 percent. They were expected to be down about 13.7 percent, so that was a little bit higher than expected, but still not too far off. Well, kind of drilling down under these numbers a little bit, so are we seeing some evidence then of herd expansion in the U.S.? There's a little bit appearing in this. Um, the, the main thing is that, that heifers are being held back on the farm uh, rather than being placed, but it's something that'll take a little bit more time to, to start showing up in the future. Well, overall, was this uh, kind of neutral or positive as far as this report, the numbers that say the mercantile exchange, the impact on the futures there? Well, looking just at the numbers and at the report itself, it's, it's a fairly neutral report because it wasn't too far off from expectations. But when we look at the markets, they came down a little bit after the report did come out. All right, um, what is box beef doing now that we're in another week uh, kind of removed from that report, what is it doing and what is that saying maybe about demand for beef right now? Well, we've seen box beef come up. Uh, last check it was falling around 249 uh, and, and that was about $10 per hundred weight higher than it was a week ago. So it's, it's been kind of coming up a little bit. But I think a lot of that is, is we've, we're seeing kind of a, a seasonal cycle when we're coming out of the cold winter season and we're starting to get into the, the spring grilling season and so our supermarkets are starting to buy more and, and stock up on their meat. Although this week it seems like we won't get to grilling season, <laughs> but yeah. I guess we will eventually. <laughs> um, as far as uh, overall beef sector, what's your outlook looking down the road? I'd say slightly bearish, um, mainly because of that, that seasonal trend that, that I was talking about. Um, entering the spring, we see the demand for meat pick up but at the same time, we're still seeing real high uh, boxed beef prices and high cattle prices in general. Plus, there's competition from other meats, uh, poultry and, and pork. Are, are the prices are good there compared to the high beef prices. That interview was recorded the week of all the snow in Mississippi. Open outcry futures trading is coming to an end in Chicago and New York this summer. In explaining this move, the CME group says open outcry now accounts for only 1% of the total futures volume at its different exchanges. Time for the trivia quiz. This week it's about a Mississippi crop and here's a question for you. How many states grow peanuts commercially? Is the answer A, 7, B, 15, C, 20, or D, 31? I'll have that for you at the end of the markets. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Leighton Span reports the strong dollar is hurting U.S. ag exports while China holds the key to the cotton market. In the feature segment today, it was a record-breaking year at the 2015 Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions in Jackson, Mississippi.
Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. A MSU Forestry Short Course on Handling Extreme Weather Events in Family Forest takes place Thursday, March 26. The location is the Tate County Extension Office at Number 1 French's Alley in Senatobia. The hours are 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Cost is $25 and that includes lunch. The short course will cover ways for timber owners to handle events such as timber damage due to ice storms or wind. IRS timber loss casualty provisions and timber insurance will be covered as well. The White Sand Branch Unit of the Mississippi Ag and Forestry Experiment Station will hold its annual field day Saturday, March 28th. The hours are 9 a.m. to 1.15 p.m. This will include lunch. It's located 10 miles west of Poplarville on Highway 26. Forage research, including cool, cool season grasses and small grains, will be covered. Heifer shrank on ryegrass and the effect of extended release deworming on beef steers will be covered. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now let's check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. The surge of the dollar continues to be a big story, a story that is hurting ag exports. The dollar hit a 12-year high on Friday, March 13th, but it has come down a bit as we record this section of Farm Week. Analyst Naomi Bloom has this take on what the future holds for the dollar on market to market. It's going to continue to work a little higher in the short term and then start to stabilize and trade sideways. We're not looking to see any reprieve in the recent action just because of how the U.S. economy is improving truly overall. And so that's what's keeping that dollar well supported. Um, so again, Good for the economy, of course, not so great for our uh, commodities, though. Of course, that really affects our export market, and, and we're already seeing that. Well, China is said to be holding most of the cards as far as the cotton market as spring begins. Analyst Don Roo says the predominant view continues to be that cotton acreage will be shifting away. In the meantime, he says he thinks the cotton market is showing some similarities to the U.S. soybean trade. Uh, we kind of stabilized about the same time the soybeans did. We pushed to the upside. A little bit of talk about reduced acres maybe in the cotton. Uh, but fundamentally, it's uh, very similar to the soybeans. It's a supply bear market. Before the feature story on Farm Week, let's check the trivia answer for this week. The correct choice is B. 15 states, including Mississippi, grow peanuts commercially. This according to the National Peanut Board. In today's feature segment, Farm Week's Amy Taylor reports that this year's Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions in February delivered another record-breaking year. That's right, artists, 4-H and FFA livestock exhibitors who earned champion titles at Dixie National Junior Roundup sold their animals for top dollar. Additionally, 35 scholarships were awarded to exhibitors who excelled in showing livestock as well as academics. Those who win a champion title at Dixie National Junior Roundup say they'll never forget the joyful feeling of that winning handshake from the judge. Because at that moment, they knew the next stop would be the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. Out of the 2,200 head of livestock shown at Roundup, only 43 market animals, which include market steers, lambs, goats, and hogs, made it to the big sale. This year broke the record for the highest total sales, surpassing three $382,000. Mississippi State University Extension Service Livestock Coordinator Kip Brown says watching buyers bid on high dollar animals can get intense. Some of the better memories are when two people get hung up on one animal and uh, decide they're going to show somebody how much money they got and that's really good for the kids <laughs> because uh, you have uh, you have people competing and they just continue to raise the bid. Sometimes you're rocking along there $100 licks or $500 licks and somebody really wants to go out there and, and blow the opponent out, they'll jump them three or $4,000 and a lot of times it'll shut the other guy down. Brown serves as one of the ringmen during the sale of champions. It's a critical role during the event. The most important thing is to create an excitement in the ring, uh, make a lot of noise to try and get those buyers excited about bidding on those animals and helping those kids out. Uh, and then, more importantly, know where your bid is, know who's got the bid, and then remember who bid the last time so when you have a bid, you can go back and put that guy back in. And then at the same time, there are three of us working the ring, so 
each of us has an area that we work. So I'm in competition with the other two ring men to make sure that my buyers get the best deal. Brown says despite the competitive atmosphere, at the end of the day, it's all about celebrating young people's accomplishments. Uh, MSU Extension uh, Service Livestock Specialist uh, Dean Josan describes the types of people who purchase animals. People in the from the banking industry to agriculture credit lenders to car dealers to doctors lawyers, anything and everything in between. For the most part, there are every animal that's sold will be a group of buyers that go in together. And a lot of people try to purchase animals um, that they have a connection to. Maybe it's somebody local that they know or a customer of theirs. All buyers will be recognized at the sale uh, after every animal is sold. And then to try to go a step further, uh, they'll be recognized in the Clarion Ledger on Sunday with a two page a color ad. It's good advertisement for the buyers. It is a tax credit. Joe Sand says each of the champion animals is taken to Starkville for instructional use after the sale. Animals that are in the sale of champions this year uh, will be taken to Mississippi State University uh, to the Department of Animal Sciences where over 350 undergraduate students will have the opportunity to get a lot of hands-on experience with high quality uh, market animals. With about 1,500 exhibitors, you're probably wondering what it takes to become one of the few at the sale of champions. The road to the sale of champions starts several months before exhibitors bring their animals to compete at the Dixie National Junior Roundup. Exhibitors say there's much more to earning a champion title than just getting your animal to look good and behave for a judge. And there's much more of a science to it than you would think when it comes to conditioning a champion animal. Hagen and Katie Ware of Montgomery County made the sale by winning grand champion lamb. Because these animals will ultimately enter the food market, Hagen says lots of exercise and practice go into reaching the winning ratio of muscle and fat content. It has to have good muscle mass, um, good bone structure. It has to have a nice rack, nice top on it. It just needs to be an overall and look good in the ring. The more muscle mass it has, the better your meat quality is, but it also needs to have a little fat or finish on it so the meat tastes better. Um, uh, like a bigger lamb would have more meat on it, but we, but if you have a small lamb but has finish on it, it's more quality. Hagen also says it's essential to ration feed properly with the correct mixture of nutrients. He says showing livestock has provided the family with traveling and life lessons. We went to Oklahoma and Kansas and to Arkansas and Tennessee. I mean, we went all places and I mean, I enjoyed it because you got to see parts of the country we've never, never seen. But it's, it can be difficult to load lambs. I mean, they're just Lambs have not been labeled the smartest animal. Playing sports, you do have to have dedication to stay in practice, but you don't have that of caring for a life. I mean, you have to, with sports, if it rains, if it rains one day, you're all right. With animals, it's cold, sleet, snow, it doesn't matter. You have to feed your animal, you have to work your animal. If I don't get something, he, I can just ask him and he'd show me. Like at the very beginning, I didn't really know how to teach them to walk, so he helped me out. Katie Ware says another valuable life lesson concerns the importance of good sportsmanship. Say good job if you like you won or you lost and you know the person who won, you always need to congratulate them because they could have they worked pretty hard too. In addition to auctioning champion animals, 35 deserving exhibitors were awarded Dixie National Sale of Champions scholarships at $1,500 each. Recipients Peyton Netherland of Holmes County and Nicholas Webb of Lafayette County say they acquired skills that will serve them well in college. The biggest thing I've learned is responsibility, like you have to take care of your animal, you can't just think about yourself. When you get up in the morning, you know you have to feed. You can't just get up and get yourself ready. You know you have something else to get ready. And when it comes showtime, you can't just get up and go. You have to get up early enough to have time to get your animal ready and yourself ready to go in the show ring. The biggest skill I learned doing livestock is patience, because those animals aren't going to cooperate every day, and they're going to they're going to give you something to make you mad. So, patience is a is a big part of life. You got to learn how to roll with the punches and. 
there's going to be people out there that are just hard-headed like them animals. With unwavering support from family, buyers, and elected officials like Governor Phil Bryant and State Ag Commissioner Cindy Hyde-Smith, 4-H and FFA livestock programs will continue developing outstanding citizens for years to come. From Jackson, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. You can watch the story again on our Farm Week website, Facebook page, or YouTube. We'll have links and telephone numbers there for you to find out more about junior livestock shows in Mississippi. You can also contact your county Extension Service Office to join Mississippi 4-H. Participation through Mississippi FFA is available at many public schools. Our website is farmweek.msucares.com. Well, does that bring back memories? It absolutely does. It's always great to come back every year and, and cover this story. So it's, it's always a pleasure. And I uh, still remember getting up every morning, every, yeah. <laughs> being there every night. I sure do. <laughs> I, it's something you'll never forget, for sure. <laughs> well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, is logging compatible with sustainable forestry? Jason Smith, Mississippi's Outstanding Logger of the Year, says timber's ability I'm to regrow mean, makes it a vital resource. Uh, In the Food Factor, Natasha will show us how to dye Easter eggs using natural materials. And in Southern Gardening next week, we'll have a visit from Rod Serling in the Garden Zone. For the rest of the Farmer Crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.